Guess what day it is? Oh, oh. It's French Friday, it's French Friday, so grab your fries and say hooray! David French is here to play on French Friday! It's French Friday! David, welcome back. Thanks so much for having me, but we're remote this time. I know, it's not the same as having you in studio, which was a lot of fun. We appreciated your time. Um, we have not really talked since the Dobbs decision about abortion, and we're overdue. It's yeah. time to do that. Um, <laughs> let, let's begin here, just to get people up to speed, not that people aren't aware of what's going on, but remind us about the parameters of the Dobbs decision. It, it came on a case from Mississippi that was arguing for, was it a 15-week ban on abortion? Yes, yes, right, exactly. So... What happened is, in a nutshell, is that a Mississippi passed a ban on abortion after 15 weeks. I was challenged in court because it was incompatible with Casey. Um, There were two key cases prior to Dobbs. Roe v. Wade, which established that the Constitution protects a right to abortion. And then Planned Parenthood v. Casey, which was the 1992 case after Roe v. Wade, that really overturned Roe without overturning the right to an abortion, if that makes sense. Uh, Roe was settled on a trimester framework. Casey did away with that and instead said there is a right to an abortion, preserved a right to an abortion in the Constitution, but said um, that states could regulate that right so long as the regulations did not impose an undue burden. Which is quite ambiguous, and that's where there was a lot of wiggle room for objections. Uh, Yeah. Right. Now, the reason why the Mississippi 15-week ban was incompatible with Casey was that Casey, um, 15 weeks is pre-viability, okay? So the undue burden analysis um, had a lot to do with viability. In other words, if it's a pre-viability abortion, there was much less, you couldn't ban pre-viability abortions under Casey, right? So because this would be incompatible with Casey, the only way to uphold the 15-week ban would be to overrule Casey in whole or in part. And so, or to seriously modify Casey. That's the only way that 15-week ban could survive. And the majority decision written by Justice Alito leaked famously back in May, and the actual ruling when it came out was slightly modified, but barely at all from the leaked one. And it essentially turns the whole question of abortion regulation and legality back to the states. And since then, we've seen a number of states go in a number of different directions with blue states going to protect even expanding uh, availability of abortion and some more conservative red states outline it completely and even going flirting with the idea of criminalizing and prosecuting women right. who pursue an abortion, which is really where I want to guide our conversation. Right. So there is a movement within the pro-life or under the pro-life umbrella, which is known as abortion abolitionism. Right. I had not heard that term prior to this year, I think. Although, as I've studied and read up on the, on the perspective, I realized I actually encountered this about 25 years ago for the first time. I just didn't know what to call it. Tell us what is abortion abolitionism and juxtapose that with what is sometimes called abortion incrementalism. Right. And well, I actually don't think those are the two things that are diametrically opposed. I would say the two things that are opposed are abortion abolitionism and the mainstream pro-life movement. Right. Which includes the concept of incrementalism, but is not incrementalism isn't the summary of what the mainstream pro-life movement is. So what abortion abolitionism at its essence is saying is that abortion is murder. They're mur- it should be treated as homicide. It should be treated the way murder is treated under the law. In other words, anyone who's involved in the killing should re- face prosecution. That any kind of incremental um, incremental ban or incremental limit on abortion is compromised with the abortion regime. So if you have a 15-week a ban, well, that's still permitting abortions up to 15 weeks, which doesn't abolish abortion, which needs to be opposed. So it's opposed to incrementalism. It treats everyone involved in the abortion process as if they're committing uh, the crime of murder 
It doesn't recognize exceptions. So in, in some versions of abortion abolitionism, uh, even an abortion to save the life of the mother would be uh, banned or to pr- protect the physical health of the mother would be banned or to, um, or to in a, certainly in cases of rape or incest. So it's a very dramatic position that essentially says any, any legal accommodation that allows for continued abortion is to be condemned. And that the taboo in the mainstream pro-life movement that's long existed against advocating for prosecuting women should be removed. Now, there are abolitionists who would say, no, 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 I'm not that extreme, but um, many abolitionists are. And in fact, there was an SBC, Southern Baptist Convention, resolution that was passed last year in 2021 that was very close to uh, abolitionism. And here's some of the key language. It says, whereas since 1980, the SBC has passed many resolutions reaffirming the importance of human life at all stages of development, but we have yet to call for the immediate abolition of abortion without exception or compromise. Or compromise. And it says, resolved that the messengers of the SBC meeting in Nashville, Tennessee, do state unequivocally that abortion is murder And we reject any position that allows for any exceptions to the legal protection of our pre-born neighbors. Now, this was watered down a little bit um, that essentially says it's rejecting incrementalism alone. But again, here's another thing that it says. uh, Whereas over the past 48 years with 60 plus million abortions, traditional pro-life laws, though well intended, have not established equal protection and justice for the pre-born. But on the contrary, contrary, appallingly have established incremental regulatory guidelines for when, where, why, and how to obtain legal abortion of innocent preborn children. So that's the Southern Baptist Convention in 2021. And that's when I would say the abolitionist movement really sort of burst, burst forth in a much more prominent way. Okay, let's, let's back up a minute and two things. First of all, it, it, with Dobbs, with the overturning of Roe Casey, abolitionists' point of view actually has gained traction because now in a state-by-state battle over what the law should be around abortion, they have an opportunity to actually implement what they've been saying for many years. Whereas prior to Dobbs, it was kind of moot, right? You, you can't do this anywhere in the country because Roe Casey wouldn't allow you to do this. But now that it's actually possible, theoretically, to pass these laws criminalizing abortion and prosecuting women who have them, it it feels like I'm bumping into more and more rhetoric around this movement. And I'm finding more and more Christians who are finding it somewhat appealing, like this makes sense to them. But before that, I want to talk about language a little bit, Mm -hmm. because I find it interesting that they chose to brand themselves as abortion abolitionists. I mean, they could have chosen a different word. They could have become right. abortion prohibitionists, drawing right. from another bit of American history. <laughs> well, but that's they got chose... a little bit less less uh, cultural resonance than abolitionists. That's right. But it, it, it makes sense why they would choose abolitionists, because their basic argument has been slavery was an unmitigated evil. And mm-hmm. nobody would say we should have an incremental approach to the abolition of slavery. Nobody would say that, well, we, we should at least allow people to be slaves up until... I don't know, they're 18 years old, I don't know, whatever. Right. Compromise with slavery is untenable to the modern mind, hopefully, for most people. Mm -hmm. And their argument is the same should be true of abortion. There should be no sanction for this anywhere in our society because, in fact, they would argue it's even more evil than slavery because it is murder Mm -hmm. from their point of view. Um, Talk about, first, let's make the case, let's make their case for them. What is appealing? about their argument and why do you think it is finding more traction with people well two things i think that are appealing about the argument one it has a very very straight ahead logic to it right that look if the unborn child is a child of equal value and worth as a child who's if it's you know a second trimester it's of a child of equal value and worth to a child that's six months old, right? Or six years old or a person 50 years old. If they're of equal value, 
and they're of equal, their humanity, they have the same humanity, fundamental humanity, then why would they be treated differently? This is a human being like any other human being, and therefore the law should treat them exactly the same. So there's a very straight ahead logic to it. Um, the second thing that's very appealing about it, I think, is more of our cultural moment, which really puts a premium on who's going to be the re who's truly committed, right? So in other words, you know, everyone else is sort of weak. Who's strong? So especially on the right, you're going to have, and, and some of this is on the left as well, but not about abortion, but, uh, uh, uh well, about abortion on the other side, <laughs> but, uh, would be, well, wait a minute. Everyone else is sort of a squish. Everyone else is a little squeamish. Everyone else is searching for the world's approval. And we're the real ones. Like, we're the ones who don't care about the world's approval. We're the ones who see the humanity of the unborn child. We're the ones who are really, truly pro-life here. We're the tough ones. So there's a straight-ahead logic to it. And then there's a kind of a cultural right-wing, modern right-wing logic to it, which is, well, you know, we're, we're the ones who are the strongest on this position. We're the least compromising. And there's a lot of sort of, on a bunch of fronts, right, you see this kind of logic unfolding. We're the ones who are really committed to taking the fight to the other side, and this is how you take the fight to the other side. Enough with persuasion, enough with the, you know, this kind, it's, a, it's about the law, and it's about imposing legal regimes, and so there's a kind of a cultural moment aspect to it tied to and connected with the straight-ahead sort of logic of, you know, the, the uh, humanity of the unborn child. So t taking those two points, the, the logic of the argument and the cultural moment, is this a case where the pro-life movement finds itself in a situation where it's sort of the dog that caught the car? Meaning, yeah. for decades, the rhetoric coming out of the pro-life movement has been, you know, Dr. Seuss, a person is a person no matter how small. The personhood right. of, the, of the unborn child, the personhood of the fetus, the personhood of the embryo, like it, it's a person. And that's been the rhetoric and argument, whether... I don't know if that holds up legally, but it's the popular rhetoric that I've heard for decades. And so now we suddenly right. find ourselves in a post Roe Casey legal environment. And it's like, OK, well, you've been saying it's a person. Now the law is opened up. There's a possibility of passing legislation that legally recognizes the personhood of that unborn child. Are you serious or not? And it, mm -hmm. is that part of what's going on here, that their own rhetoric is is now being used to push an agenda that most pro-life people are not on board with criminalizing and prosecuting women, but the logic they built for the last 50 years is now being used against them? Well, to an extent, I think. So in, if you're saying, look, the reason why I'm pro-life and the reason why I'm pro-life is I believe the unborn child is a distinct human being deserving of protection under the law, then the, I, to turn around and say, well, is it or is it not a distinct human being deserving of protection under the law? and and that's, you know, so having that turnaround and, and people confronting you with that, I think, is an entirely fair discussion to have. It's and, and to the question of, is this the dog that caught the car? To some extent, because a lot of the differences in the pro-life movement that existed before the sort of the abolitionist movement really started to have its moment, were still there. There, there was a lot of simmering um, disagreement about pro-life laws even before Dobbs. So going back to before Dobbs, there was a disagreement in pro-life circles as to whether or not state legislatures should push for things like heartbeat bills, even though they were going to be immediately struck down in the courts. And my position was, I think you should push for heartbeat bills because heartbeat bills and 15-week bans like in Mississippi are incompatible with Roe and Casey. And there was no real way to overrule Roe and Casey unless you pass laws incompatible with Roe and Casey and challenge them up to the Supreme Court. If what you were doing was always passing laws that would restrict abortion but were not incompatible with Roe and Casey, you weren't going to have the case that could overturn them. And so there was a combination play at once of both um, incremental laws that were being passed like things like, say, waiting periods or ultrasound laws or laws regulating abortion clinics and 
uh, admitting privileges laws, saying that doctors and abortion clinics had to have admitting privileges to a local hospital. Those were all very incremental changes. But simultaneously, two tracks were being pursued at once. And I was on both tracks. I was yes to incrementalism, yes to heartbeat bills, uh, in the hopes of confronting the Supreme Court with the reality that a big chunk of America was through the democratic process, recognizing the humanity of the unborn child. And there was that, that Roe and Casey rested on completely bogus constitutional grounds. Once the Supreme Court says, you're right, Roe and Casey were on, rested on bogus constitutional grounds, then you no longer really have that ability to necessarily be on both tracks at once, <laughs> if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And so it was natural that you would begin to have some of these divisions break out in the pro-life movement because they were always there. It's just that they weren't particularly salient because Roe and Casey were right. the law of the land. Okay. So a couple things. A few weeks ago, I, I, I wanted to study the abolitionist point of view and understand it better and read up on it. And so I go to the source of all truth and that's Twitter. I put a poll... <laughs> I put oh, a poll man. up on my Twitter feed just asking, hey, if you consider yourself pro-life, do you believe, and you, you consider yourself pro-life and you believe that, you know, an unborn child is, is actually human and a person and all that, do you believe that women who have abortion should be prosecuted? 80% said no. These are mm -hmm. pro-life people. 80% mm -hmm. say no, they don't believe they should be prosecuted. 7% um, said yes, they should be prosecuted. And I believe 12% said they weren't sure. And of the people who said, yes, they should be prosecuted, I asked them why. Like, give me, give me the argument for the abolitionist point of view. And some of them sent me articles and resources, and I started reading up on it. Um, and one of the arguments that came up over and over and over again was the incrementalist approach, the, the general posture of the pro-life movement, the majority of the pro-life movement, they say, is not actually trying to ban abortion. They're just trying to regulate it. So even mm. the 15 week ban from Mississippi that led to the Dobbs decision really wasn't banning abortion. It was just regulating it or parental notification bills or fetal heartbeat bills. All these kinds of things are just regulating. It's not banning. And they see that as compromise with evil. Um, and the other argument that came up a lot, and I know you've written about this, is the general posture from the, the majority of the pro-life movement is that there are two victims in any abortion. There's the child, but the mother herself is also a victim and therefore shouldn't be seen as um, a perpetrator to be prosecuted, but to be cared for as someone who's mm -hmm. been hurt in this process as well. And the abolitionist movement basically says that's ridiculous. That's there infantilizing. Are not, right. It's infantilizing to treat these mm -hmm. women as if they're too stupid and ignorant to know what the decision was that they made. How do you respond to that, this infantilizing of women by saying they're victims also in, in the abortion decision? Yeah, so I, my, I have a, a couple prong response here. One is, and this is something that there's a, a, there's a really um, a, a great piece, uh, a great book by Francis Beckwith, um, a book called Defending Life. And he has a, a provision, a part of the book that talks about this issue. And I think it's, it's done very well. Uh, and he says, uh, those folks who are wanting to craft laws on abortion should take into consideration a few facts. Um, uh, one, unborn human beings are full-fledged members of the human community, and to kill them with no justification is unjustified homicide. Two, because of a general lack of understanding of the true nature of the unborn child, likely due to decades of cultural saturation, by abortion choice rhetoric and little serious philosophical reflection on the pro-life position by the general public, most citizens who procure abortions do so out of well-meaning ignorance, which I think is a very important philosophical point under the law. And I think that's something that has to be wrestled with under in any just law. And number three, the woman who will seek and obtain an Ill illegal abortion is really a second victim. Women who seek illegal abortion will probably do so out of desperation. Not all of them, not yeah. all of them. And it says not realizing at the time of the abortion that the procedure kills a real human being. And you say, oh, 
that's infantilizing, that's infantilizing. But, but wait, let's back up. How many times have you had an argument or a discussion with somebody who is pro-choice where they present a lot of good faith arguments that the, especially first trimester, especially first trimester and sometimes moving into second trimester, fetus, unborn child, shouldn't be and is not in fact exactly the same as a six-month-old. Shouldn't be treated as and is not in fact exactly the same as a six-month-old. And, and they'll bring up you know, tr history and tradition such as treating pregnancy and, and tr uh, uh, abortion shouldn't uh, be, it, you know, was really only prohibited after quickening, for example, that sort of uh, the, the, the knowledge of the movement of the baby. So there's a lot of argument over the status, especially of the early, um, early term unborn child, a lot of argument over that status. And so it's not the same thing it's sort of saying about a six-month-old or six-year-old, there's no argument in America over the status of a six-month-old and six-year-old. There's no good faith disagreement over that. And so in many ways, if you're talking about what is the law supposed to deal with when you're talking about murder statutes, and let's be really clear about what murder is. So murder is deemed in, typically as the intentional, unjustified killing of a human being. OK, there. So you have intent to kill a human being. Right. Well, if the intent element um, is not present, in other words, that the there is certainly an intent to gain to have an abortion, but an intent to kill a human being is not present. Then under traditional understandings of murder, for example, you don't prosecute somebody for murder under those circumstances. And so. If we're in a country and a society where there is widespread disagreement over the legal status of the unborn child, then the imposition of a murder regime that treats the unborn child as if the societal understanding is the same as a six-month-old or a six-year-old would be unjust, okay? So that's, that's one part of it. Um, can I oh, can sorry. I interject yeah, here? Yeah, sure. Because I mean, there's a lot to take in. All right, couple things. Number one, you know this. I'm not an abolition abolitionist right, on this topic, right. so I'm I'm trying to play devil's advocate with their arguments, and I know you're going to bat them down. But here's the thing: you're right. Murder is about intent. There are other things you can be prosecuted for, like manslaughter, which right. is not about intent. And then, but the other issue here is. Why should we treat an entire class of people, meaning women who've had abortions, under the same umbrella of ambiguity, of ignorance, of, um, you know, not, not actually having intent, when we wouldn't do that with any other large group of people who have committed homicide, right? The, the, the taking of a human life. Normally, there's a case to be made where prosecutors look at an individual case, they look at the evidence of intent, and then they decide, is this murder? Is this manslaughter? Was this an accidental homicide? Whatever it might be. And you prosecute based on what's discovered. Why not take that same approach with abortion where rather than saying everyone who's had an abortion, none of them are guilty of murder. None of them are guilty of, you know, whatever the crime might be. They're all in this category of ignorant uh perhaps even well-intentioned decision that shouldn't be prosecuted. And in the abolition, ab I keep saying abolitionist rather than abolitionist. Um, some are saying, yeah, we should prosecute for flat out murder with all these cases. Others are saying maybe it's not murder. In other words, they're not put behind bars for mm -hmm. life or capital punishment or some other heinous punishment, but why not criminalize it and have some kind of prosecution where there is a penalty for this, even if it's not the same as murder one. Well, and, and most states that ban abortion, that are not banning abortion under an abolitionist regime, do in fact have criminal penalties for an unlawful abortion. On the, the woman. Criminal pe not on the woman. Well, that's the but point, they do though. Have is it, right. That, I mean, there's been a lot of rhetoric around prosecuting the physicians and others who aid in it from a medical point mm -hmm. of view. Why not prosecute the woman? Yeah, but, you know, so... The, the question there is, and then again, you, you get to second phase of what I was going to talk about. So number, phase number one is the mens rea issue. 
that, uh, as Beckwith notes, the idea that people are engaging in the intentional killing of a human, a person that they know to be a human being of the same value worth as somebody who's six month old, six years old, whatever, just is absent. Okay. Then the second part of this, uh, which I think is, is really, um, important is what do we know about why people get abortions? Okay, what, what is it that we know about this? And this is something that's not been sufficiently studied, to be honest. It's been studied. It's not been sufficiently studied. The abortion issue, a lot of the surveys and the polling data and all of this around abortion is, quite fl- frankly, often trash. Um, abortion polling, by and large, has got a lot of problems. But I'm sure my Twitter act- poll was very scientifically accurate. Yeah, oh, it's str- that was the gold standard. Scott. I'm sure. That was the, yeah. Um, but if you're talking about um, actually taking a look at to to why people get abortions, um, there's this tremendous study by Trisha Bruce at Notre Dame from a couple of years ago, where what she did is she brought hundreds of people in, demographically representative, and rather than just simply asking them a series of questions about say trimesters or or do you call yourself pro-life or pro-choice? She asked them to talk about abortion and to sort of get their feelings. And what she found was as a political matter, her sample broke down kind of like the way the polling samples do. A minority are very pro-life and would ban all or most abortions. Another minority are very pro-choice and would permit abortion all the way up till birth. A big group in the middle were had a, a discomfort you know, it, at some point they would say no, whether it was six weeks or 15 weeks or 20 weeks, they would say no. And, but what was interesting is that she found of all of the people, all of the people that were interviewed, none of them, not even the most pro, pro-choice would label abortion as a desirable good. Mm-hmm. None of them. Right. I remember and that. So, poll. yeah, it's really fascinating. It and is. So why, why do people get abortions? relationship stress. In other words, they have an abusive boyfriend or they have an abusive husband or the boyfriend bailed or the husband bailed. So a relate relationship instability, financial instability, all of these things, a, a sense of uncertainty, instability, um, are things that play into the decision whether or not to abort. And this is where we're getting to this idea of the woman as also a victim of the process. So, um, is the woman it under what circumstances has the has the father bailed? Has that have they lost a job? Is like some of the, my classmates in high school are their parents telling them to get an abortion or they'll be thrown out of the house? So okay, and so I, yeah. hold on, David. Like I mean, I'm with you again. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to play devil's advocate here. Why sure. not take those things into consideration on a case by case basis? in the process of prosecution. Why not? I mean, we would do this with anyone who's being accused of murder or manslaughter or whatever, and you come in, you realize, well, she killed her husband because he was beating her every day, and there's these circumstances where it was in self-defense, and you go, okay. But we wouldn't just say anybody who's taken a human life, there had to be extreme circumstances. We're just not even going to bother to pass a law and prosecute anybody. I mean, that's what the abolitionist side is saying here is, no, let's have the default be you've taken a human life and that needs to be seen and protected and equal justice comes up a ton in their arguments. And if there are mitigating circumstances in a particular case of abortion, that should be considered. But that's the exception, not the rule. So already we've established that a large percentage of these people over have no, do not have the mens rea. We've also established that a large number of these people are operating under a degree of du- duress. So then we get to the the point you're saying, okay, okay, well, let's just go ahead and establish that there is a mens rea, uh, le- that let's grant that a bunch of them don't have the necessary mens rea, the state of mind. Let's go ahead and establish that a bunch of folks are under duress. Still, we should get the state in the business of determining who has received an abortion filing charges, and then allowing you to present these things as some kind of affirmative defense. Well, then now you start to get into this notion of, okay, what state apparatus here are you actually wanting to create? Right. And this is the part that I think is almost laughable, because 
if you were to pass such laws, they're virtually impossible to enforce. Uh, right. So, so what is the state apparatus here that you're wanting to create? So you've got a, here's the conceptual issue, mens rea. Here's another moral issue, duress. And then you have a practical issue, which also turns into a moral issue of the state apparatus necessary to survey the world of American pregnancies, determine who's been pregnant, who lost the pregnancy, and if they lost the pregnancy, was it a natural miscarriage or was it an abortion? Right. Right. So you're talking about a dramatic expansion of state power aimed at prosecuting what we already know to be a population of people who don't have them disproportionately don't have the mens rea and are disproportionately under duress. And so what you then end up with is a an a situation that becomes a, a an instru an overpowering instrument of state enforcement and state intrusion that begins to have its own justice issues just in the creation and execution of but it. But David, David, you are making a pragmatic argument and the abolitionists are making a principled argument. No, it's pragmatic and principled. So principle mens rea, principle and pragmatism that duress. And then it's also pragmatism and principle when you're coming to the creation of immense intrusive state law enforcement authorities. Because one of the things that we know is that there are justice issues that arise when you create ex immense state and federal law enforcement regimes. They follow like night follows day. It is not simply the case that you create a giant intrusive state enforcement rec uh, regime and justice then follows. That's not the way we know that the world works. So it sounds a little bit like you're skirting up on one of the primary arguments you hear from the pro-choice side, which is, listen, the government should stay out of women's health, women's uteruses. This is, this is a decision that a woman makes either with her family, with her husband, with her partner, with her doctor. We can't allow the government to step into this, so we should just stay out of it altogether. Yeah, well, so then you get to the other extreme. So you have one extreme, which is, well, we need the government surveilling pregnancies in the United States of right. America so that we can know whether or not to prosecute in many cases, many poor women who, for example, might already be raising, you know, s single moms who might already be raising two or three children. Um, so that's one extreme. And then the other one was you just throw your hands up in the air and say, none of this is enforceable. <laughs> so just leave it to the woman and the doctor. And the, the response of the mainstream pro-life movement is no, there are ways in which a just society can by law protect human life, including by regulating the availability of abortion resources and limiting the availability and prohibiting the availability or, you know, for example, closing clinics or uh, prohibiting the dissemination of abortion pills. Those things are much more aimed at the supply side, uh, much more uh, uh, available to law enforcement under with existing resources. Um, much few, many fewer issues regarding expansion of state surveillance and state authority. It's much more targeted at where abortions actually take place. Um, does not involve a dramatic expansion of the, uh, you know, of the the prison industrial complex, so to speak. And so there is a, a different way of looking at this that is not either one of those extremes. But Sky, but. And here's the here's what's really important. I think the smart folks in the pro-life movement know something very important. They know that law, even if law bans abortion, law cannot end abortion. And right. the real point of the pro-life movement is to end abortion. OK, I want uh, we'll come back to that in a minute, because that's also why I share your point of view, because in, in the end. I want to see abortions ended, and I know ended. there's only so yes. much the legal system can do. Okay, two other arguments that I have encountered from the abolitionist side, and they're, they're arguments that are targeting the, the majority pro-life movement and mm -hmm. pointing out what is perceived to be hypocrisy on the majority pro-life movement side. Two things. Number one, 
one article I read was really interesting, and they surveyed a bunch of pro-life literature, especially from religious groups like mm -hmm. Roman Catholic pro-life groups. In fact, the ELRC, ERLC, sorry, the Southern Baptist mm -hmm. um, Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission. And what they found in a lot of their pro-life literature was this idea that women who have abortions should be cared for and they need counseling or help or you know, various other things after having gone through an abortion. But many of them mention the fact that these women feel enormous guilt and need forgiveness. Some even going so far as to argue that they have cooperated with an evil system and do carry culpability and guilt for that and should seek God's forgiveness. And the point of view of the abolitionist folks is that, well, if they're guilty of sin and you're calling for forgiveness, then clearly there's something here that may well should be picked up by the criminal justice system, because if they're truly innocent victims and were ignorant of what they had done, then why so much guilt? Because sin that's done in, in um, ignorance usually doesn't require to necessarily bring about a guilty conscience and a need for forgiveness. Well, I mean, okay, so there's a couple of responses to that. One, the idea that I might need forgiveness for something does not then therefore translate into that thing should also be illegal. Right. But they would argue right. this okay. is the taking of a human life. Right. Which... But then we're right back to the original conversation that we started to have. Yeah. Because a lot of the feelings of pain are not related to, and and, you know, I don't know how many folks have spent time with you know, in crisis pregnancy centers and dealing with folks uh, who work, uh, spend a lot of time working in crisis pregnancy centers, that sort of feeling of remorse or pain that flows from an abortion, you can't always categorize it as, well, I know I killed a living baby. You know, it can be also categorized as I stopped this potential life, to use the, like, the language of Roe, uh, or what could this what could this fetus have been or i have tremendous regret that i listened to a boyfriend who was going to leave anyway or i can't believe my parents in a fit of shame pressed me to do this these are lots of different complicated feelings other than i know i killed a baby who's just the same as a 6 month old or a 6 year old so consciousness of a, a, that something terrible happened is not the same thing as a acknowledgement of murder or homicide, if that makes sense. Okay. Uh, then the other argument they make, and I've heard you make this argument and some of what you've written is that rather than criminalizing this and putting women in jail and prosecuting them, what we need is greater education. We need more of a cultural movement that values life, that instructs people about the value of the unborn child and those kinds of things. The abolitionist movement comes back and says, well, in a weird way, that that makes their culpability greater because the more aware people become of the human life that is within them in, in this fetal form and the more they recognize it as a person and as a human life, then they can't plead ignorance anymore when they still decide to abort that child. So in a way... Is the pro-life movement talking out of both sides of its mouth because it wants to inform and educate more people, but doesn't that raise the culpability for those who still then have an abortion? I, I guess at some point you're then saying, are you then saying, wait a minute, you could not be prosecuted unless you have an ultrasound, and then the instant you have an ultrasound, you can be prosecuted. I can think of a few better ways to prevent people from having an ultrasound. <laughs> Then well, uh, maybe that's that's a cr criminal legal liability. If you can prove that people have encountered scientific literature that speaks about a six week, fifteen week old fetus as being fully human, right? Then they're culpable, right? They they know what it is they are doing. That they've heard one side of an argument makes them culpable. It's again, hey, if, it, yeah. It's, if, it's, if, it's, if a doctor, if a doctor is forced to inform them before a procedure, hey, or when they find out they're pregnant, right. if the literature, all that is reinforces this is a human life and is has equal protection under whatever the argument is, there are ways to make people aware of the decisions they are making. 
Right, of course. And that's part of the reason for informed consent laws, for example, to try right. to make people think twice, to give people information to cause them to think twice. And um, so that's part of the whole goal of persuasion. If the answer, if the abolitionist argument is then, but then you, you cannot, so there's always, always when you're thinking about law, you're thinking about two things at once. You're thinking about principle and pragmatism. Because the way the law actually works, sometimes it becomes difficult to separate out principle and pragmatism. So what this is what I always end up doing when I'm talking to sort of my friends on the more authoritarian right is I ask, have you thought through the implications here, right? Mm -hmm. So have you thought through the implications that if I expose more people to the argument that I'm making— when there are counter arguments that other people in good faith are making, if expose more people to the argument that I'm making, the more they're exposed to my argument, they're more, there's an escalating criminal responsibility that's attached to it. Just think that through uh, as far as the actual pragmatic results of that kind of environment. And, and at that point, you know, when are the pragmatic results mean people obtaining less information and with less information, perhaps more abortions, then I'm not sure that there's the principled basis left for the position. So, you know, one of the things I think is really, really, really important here is if we're, if we are talking about ending abortion, we have to be talking about mainly persuasion, mm -hmm. mainly persuasion. Okay. Uh, for a couple of reasons. One, it takes persuasion to pass laws, right? So you don't just, we don't have monarchs. You know, you might have a few very, very, very red states that already have very low abortion rates where you could pass a more abolitionist regime. But if you're going to deal with abortion in the United States writ large, you still have to persuade an awful lot of people to your point of view. And then the other thing to realize is that, um, when laws are easily evaded, okay, this is one thing that we have learned throughout American history. When laws are easily evaded in the absence of cultural change, you cannot end, and sometimes you can't even meaningfully, necessarily meaningfully diminish the practice that you seek to ban. So, you know, we, we're now in this re-reckoning as we go through every decade or so about, for example, the war on drugs. Very, very, very easily evaded. Um, prohibitions against the use of, of Ill illicit drugs. Very, very easily evaded. And the comprehensive, massive law enforcement response that we've mobilized to deal with these easily evaded laws have had their own massive consequences in society. And so at some point you say, it has the cost yielded the benefit that we wanted. And we have to really think hard about that, even if you are, as I am, of the belief that the use of illicit drugs, it's incredibly dangerous and destructive and unhealthy and unwise. You have to think about these costs and these benefits. And so one of the things that is very important for people to remember is all the way back in 1973, according to the best data that we have, when abortion was mostly illegal in the U.S., we had a higher abortion rate than we have now. Right. A higher abortion rate. That should be very sobering to folks who think you can just pass laws. So I think laws should be just, and I think there should be cultural reform, and both of those things require an avalanche of persuasion <laughs> into the culture. And this idea that you can just sort of short-circuit that by uh, passing laws how? Without persuasion? or then passing laws in dramatically expanding the scope and reach of the state to achieve the ends you want to achieve, I think that's deeply misguided. So to begin to wrap up this part of the conversation, uh, one of the reasons I wanted to talk about this and the reason I've been intrigued by this abolitionist movement is I'm seeing more and more rhetoric this way on social media to yep, the point for where- sure on Twitter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely on Twitter, to the point where if you just hold to the mainstream pro-life position, which I would say you do and I do, I'm being called pro-choice because I'm squish. not an abol <laughs> right, a squish because I'm not an abolitionist because I believe an exception should be made for a woman whose life is at risk. And I believe that putting women behind Physical bars health. and prosecuting them is not actually going to have the effect people want. 
Um, so I, my concern is that that's going to grow more and more for various reasons that the, the consistent celebrated Christian position is going to be the abolitionist position. And I, I fear for that, but there's two other things here. And you mentioned one of them already, and that is before Roe, before 1973, yeah, the abortion rate was higher. But the other thing people forget is there was no abortion abolitionist movement before very recently. There was none. There was no movement to prosecute women who got abortions before Roe v. Wade. And go back through history, through Christian history, there's never been a movement to prosecute women who've had abortions. And so if that's the case over 2,000 years of Christian history, and suddenly some Christians are making this the cause to fight for, you got to ask yourself, why, what do we think now about pregnancy that we didn't think a hundred years ago or 200 years ago? And then finally, um, to your point that you made earlier, if you really do believe in the abolitionist logic, what it would require as far as government uh, bureaucracy to actually legislate and enforce this is absurd and oh ridiculous. Yeah. And, and, and all that leads me to this place of, you know, a pregnant, a pregnancy is such a unique condition in that, I mean, not unique and rare. A lot of women are pregnant all the time, but it's something that is so powerful and intimate where two people, a mother and a child are intimately interdependent with one another in a way that the government can't see, the law can't see, the outside world can't see, but God can. And so what happens between that unborn child and that mother to some extent is beyond our scope to legislate and a conscience before god is i mean that's the unique thing about motherhood is they have this intimacy and this connection with another person that as a man i'll never know and yet god is involved in that in some way and don't we have to leave space for that to be the regulating factor and then our role simply becomes how do we cultivate a culture in which that is both celebrated and affirmed and hopefully creates a culture of life rather than just law and prosecution you know one of the things there's many things uh, we can do to create and help celebrate a, a culture of life and some things we've been doing actually pretty well as a pro-life movement because remember it, the, the abortion rate peaked about 80 81 and for 40 years almost 40 years it declined until mm -hmm. the Trump administration, when it increased. Trump was the first president that the abortion rate increased under since Jimmy Carter. Okay, so we can have that discussion at some point. But for about 36 years, the abortion rate is heading down. Well, there are many reasons for that, many different reasons. But a couple of them include, one, I think the church has done a much better job at destigmatizing unwed pregnancy. So mm -hmm. I have a good friend in California uh, who pro-life leader in California who says we need to act, we need to treat every pregnancy as a blessing. And that is a, that's a change from even when I was in high school, when Christian girls I knew got pregnant and they felt like it was the end for them. They were going to be excluded from their Christian school. They were going right. to be thrown out of the house. And I think a lot of that has changed and that's helped. And a lot of the data says that we, that more, uh, that more unplanned pregnancies are being carried to term than f used to be, which I think is a tribute to cultural change. But there's also some policy change. I love what Elizabeth Brunig wrote in The Atlantic. She said, make every birth free in the United States of America. If you have, if you're pregnant, you can give birth to your baby and you don't have to pay a dime. Which I sounds like. profoundly pro-life. Very. Here's another one. The Mitt Romney Child Allowance Plan begins prenatally okay mm. prenatally every person about three four months but i can't remember the exact number about three or four months before they give birth they start getting that child allowance which helps them prepare financially for the birth of the child and if we know why people get abortions well one thing we know is they give up get abortions because of deep and profound financial stress and right that mitt romney child allowance plan would do an enormous amount to eliminate, not entirely, but to alleviate dramatically child poverty in the United States. So these are two things, and the Mitt Romney plan's actually revenue neutral. It, it pulls money from, you know, it takes money from other programs and puts it here, so it's not an addition to the deficit. 
Uh, so I think, you know, we need to be thinking creatively about, along those lines about creating that culture of life. Okay, let, let, can we think talk about Herschel Walker for just a minute? <laughs> if we have okay. to. No, we, we have to. So the abortion abolitionist position, right, is that he committed murder for hire. Right. I actually have okay. heard that. Sure. The, that is the abortion abolitionist movement that he committed murder for hire. But their argument is vote for him anyway. Okay, vote for him anyway, even though he committed murder for hire. But here's my question. Would they make the same argument if he had hired his girlfriend to kill a six-year-old? Right? He could... I don't think that they would. I don't think that they would. And one of the problems that I have with the, a lot of this is that when the rubber meets the road, how much of this is Twitter rhetoric? Yeah. Versus how much of this is, I have a principle that I'm going to apply rigorously and consistently even to my own allies. And I haven't seen that. I haven't seen that because under their own logic, Herschel Walker is guilty of murder for hire. And even if you're sorry for that, even if you're sorry for that, I don't know how many people would want to elect for into the Senate someone who had hired someone to kill a six-year-old, even if they said they were sorry. Okay, so... <laughs> We keep saying we're, we're wrapping up, but there's so much to talk about here. Um, I mean, the, the central argument from the abolitionist point of view is that the rest of the pro-life movement is being hypocritical because they're claiming that this unborn child is, is a person and they're saying, fine, then let's full protection under the law, murder prosecution, all that sort of stuff. You're pointing out the hypocrisy on their side. But this brings up for me... <sighs> This is going to get me in some trouble probably, but it brings <laughs> up for me the central dilemma of the entire abortion debate. And that is, I, I, want, I don't want there to be any abortions. And I want to take a pragmatic approach to what is all the things you mentioned, the Romney provision, these other things, paid family leave that have been proven to alleviate the circumstances that lead many women to choose abortions. I'm all for that. But there's, I heard an ethicist uh, pro-choice ethicists make this case, and I found it disturbingly compelling. And she said, imagine there's a hospital and it's there's a massive fire in the hospital, and in one room, there is an infant newborn child. And in another room, there is, um, I, I don't know the number, 10 embryos right. that are fertilized. They have 23 chromosomes each. They are genetically human, and you can only save either the 10 test tubes or the newborn child. Under the logic of the abolitionist point of view, you should save the 10 embryos, not the newborn child. And yet everything in me wants to go and save that newborn child if I had to make the choice. And, and that's the hypocrisy that's kind of built into this whole thing. And even as you pointed out with the Herschel Walker example, like, if they're really consistent, they shouldn't vote for him because they should believe that him funding an abortion is no different than him funding the murder of a six-year-old. But they're even inconsistent on that because there's something just in us that intrinsically sees a difference or acknowledges some difference between a child who's born or an older person and an embryo. And I don't know what to do with that just practical reality. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of emotional, psychological complexity built into that right you could do a different kind of analysis that says there's a fire and in one room is your wife and in another room are 10 women that you've never met before in your life right who are you going to save <laughs> right and you know in that circumstance the everything in you every last fiber of molecule of in your body is saying save your wife that you know you have to do that. You can't abandon your own wife. And so some of these kind of um, hypothetical games, I think, are of limited utility. <laughs> they are. Yeah. I'm not saying you base you know, law and policy on them. Right. Exactly. So a lot of these, um, I, a lot of this can be explained by, well, I can interact with the baby. I, you sort of know the baby. And the test tube becomes theoretical in the sense of the 10 people you don't know in the next room versus your wife. So a lot of this, these kinds of hypotheticals, I, I used to be kind of annoying in law school because I really rejected a lot of these arguments based on hypotheticals that are not real world. 
um, and not, you know, not, they're not based on foreseeable situations in, in real life. Although they can be of some use to sort of like press the limits of your intellectual position. I think there are very limited utility when you're talking about how do you make real world kind of decisions. But it is, it is a question that I think highlights a reality that we do have a very different psychological, emotional reaction to a six-month-old baby than you do to, say, 10 fertilized eggs, right? You do. And I've never met somebody who wouldn't have a very different psychological, emotional reaction to a six-month-old baby versus 10 fertilized eggs. I've never met that person. And what does that mean is worth thinking through intentionally and seriously and philosophically. Right. And and your point about the Herschel Walker example is that even those who are the abolitionists who are saying, hey, we're, we are the ones who are being logically and ethically consistent, even they fall victim to that right. same tendency. And if we exactly. don't, if we don't allow that to factor into the way we talk about this topic and including those we may disagree with on the topic, then we're just being intellectually dishonest. And that's what I can't stand about the whole thing. Anyway, yeah. uh, and now, as they say on Monty Python, uh, now for something completely different. <laughs> um, last time we were together, we had a brief conversation about the Lord of Ring, the Lord of the Rings, the Rings of Power Amazon television show, which is now wrapped up. Uh, the season finale was it was an eight. Was it eight episodes total? Um, yes. It's behind us. So for those of you who are watching it and don't want spoilers, come back to this part of the conversation later. But David, uh, first of all, I just want to congratulate you on predicting correctly both the true identity of Sauron and the fact that the stranger ended up being, if not Gandalf, then a wizard who is remarkably like Gandalf. <laughs> so overall, what, what did you think of the series? I really enjoyed it. I'm not going to say it was perfect. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I, there are things you know, that I have nits to pick. But I really enjoyed it, and I'll tell you how much I enjoyed it, because I actually got much less enthusiastic about House of the Dragon while I was watching Rings of Power. Hmm. Um, and the reason is because I felt like Rings of Power had a soul to it, and has a soul to it, um, that's consistent with the Tolkien ethos, that reminds me why I love Tolkien so much more than R. R. George R. R. Martin's work. <laughs> yeah. And, and so I felt like the R Rings of Power especially the Galadriel Sauron dynamic was true to how Tolkien conceived of these two characters. And in being true to how he conceived those two characters, it was really true to how Tolkien sees a world with good and evil um, and how he sees a higher, a higher purpose and a higher reality than like Martin's work does. And so I really liked it. I really so, liked it. I'm glad you brought that up because that's one of the things that has gotten criticism. And there's all these haters out there who've just written off Rings of Power from before they even saw the first episode for various reasons. But some of the haters out there were arguing that the Galadriel Sauron dynamic was not Tolkien. It was not, it was inconsistent with his ethos and the way he framed these characters. And you make the opposite case. So explain yes. To those who may be somewhat familiar with the lore, first of all, what did the Rings of Power show do with these two characters, and yeah. why do you believe it to be consistent with right, Tolkien? Buckle up, because this, <laughs> this is about to be some deep nerdery, okay? So what, it, what, what the show demonstrated, without giving away too much if you haven't seen it, is you had a Galadriel character who was not so much like the Galadriel character you saw in the in the movies, and not as much like the Galadriel character you saw in the the Tolkien Lord of the Rings books, the trilogy. Um, she was much more hot headed. She was much more impulsive. She was very single minded, um, and so in that sense, she didn't seem as wise as she was when she was Galadriel of Lothlorien, you know, the Lady of the Wood. And then Sauron was not the Burning Eye. He was this charismatic, young-looking, uh, good guy. Seemed like a good guy at mm -hmm. times. And so here's the buckle up part. Okay, why would you portray Galadriel like that? Well, let's not forget she's a Noldor. Okay, and what did the Noldor do in Silmarillion? They defied the Valar 
to leave Middle-earth to pursue the Silmarils that had been taken by Morgoth. She defies the doom of Mandos. She does not participate in the kinslaying, but she still plunges in to, uh, plunges in to, to fight the war against Morgoth. And then, in Unfinished Tales, Tolkien says of her, which is very interesting, she had dreams of far lands and dominions that might be her own to order as she would without tutelage. So here you have uh, a Noldoran elf who has pursued Morgoth to the ends of the earth and has dreams of her own dominions. Which is very Sauron-like. Which is very Sauron-like. So you can see, and you see echoes of that in actually the Lord of the Rings trilogy where she is tempted by the ring. Right. Even though she's older and wiser. Uh, now, what about Sauron? Okay, at this time, he's not the burning eye of Lord of the Rings. Before the fall of Numenor, and spoiler of a 50-year-old book, he could assume what Tolkien would call a fair form or put on a fair hue. And there was even a time after the War of Wrath where he seemed to repent of his evil. And this is what Tolkien wrote. Sauron put on his fair hue and abjured all his evil deeds. And some hold that this was not at first falsely done, but that Sauron in truth repented, if only out of fear, being dismayed by the fall of Morgoth. But, and there's a but with him, he was unwilling to face the, the judgment of the Valar, so he, and this is Tolkien again, he hid himself in Middle-earth, and he fell back into evil, for the bonds that Morgoth had laid upon him were very strong. So this hiding part explains Galadriel's quest to find him. And the fair hue explains how he was able to deceive and how he could appear good and how he would deceive the elves when they were learning the craft of forging the rings. So that's some deep nerdery, but you see all of that in the show. Yeah, uh, to go into the Sauron thing a little bit, based on Tolkien's wording there, it, it leaves room for the possibility that Sauron was reluctant to enter back into his evil ways because it didn't work out so well last time. But on the other side, he didn't want to face the consequences either. So he's stuck in this almost purgatory like state yeah. of which way is he going to go? Is he going to face what the evil he's done and re truly repent? Or is he just kind of going to lay low to the heat blows over and then return to his ways? And I mean, not to be too spiritual about this, but <laughs> I mean, we've all experienced this. Yeah. We have all felt a level of shame or guilt or a dread for some sinful thing we've done, but we're not fully repentant yet. And there's a question mark of, are we going to fully repent or are we just going to wait until those waves of guilt go away and then re as a and fool hide. returns to his folly, right? And yeah. that's, that's the Sauron character here. And I yeah. found that to be really fascinating. And... I mean, I, I don't understand why people are punishing the Rings of Power for giving Tolkien's characters actual arcs and development. Right. I mean, plainly, if you read the Silmarillion, if you if you you read the story of the the fall of Numenor, you you see how Sauron and was you know he was Morgoth's great lieutenant. He he repents maybe genuinely, but he's afraid, so he hides. Then he emerges and as sort of in this fair hue, he goes through a lot of different phases. And, and I think that that's an important reality. You know, mm -hmm. you, when Adam and Eve, after the fall, what they do, they hid, right? They hid. And um, here's Sauron. He, what what he do after the fall of Morgoth? He hid. He hid. But the, the chains that Mar Morgoth put upon him were very, very strong. And then there's this other thing, though, that I think is really important. And I believe this is in episode six. Um, so a big difference between the Tolkien world and the Martin world is the in the Martin world, there is not, while there are prophecies and things like that, there is not a sense of a good, sort of a benevolent hand or a good yeah. God. There's much more a sense of if the gods are real, they are capricious and mm -hmm. angry. Or, but there's this there's this quote from episode six that is actually taken from Return of the King. I, I, yeah, Return of the King, and it was when Bronwyn was talking to her son Theo before the battle, 
the the big the fight in in on in episode six. In the end, the shadow is but a small and passing thing. There is light and high beauty forever beyond its reach. So they pull one of the most famous quotes from Lord of the Rings and put it in Rings of Power to really connect. I think the fundamental ethos of the show, which is Tolkien, it is not Martin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and that's why it's hard for me to dive back into Martin. Yeah. Another way of thinking about it is when I engage in Martin stuff, the, the Game of Thrones world, it feels very pre-Christian. It feels very pagan in its mm -hmm. outlook. And Tolkien obviously was Catholic and saturated in Christian thought and sacramental views of the world. And, and you see that throughout his universe. Okay. Um, last thing I want to talk about the Gandalf character a little bit and the, the stranger. I mean, they did, I, you and I were talking in the car when I was dropping you back at Wheaton after our, our last podcast. And I said, oh, I, d I didn't think the stranger was going to be Gandalf because it was, it would be such a bait and switch. And yet that's right. exactly what they did. They were baiting us the whole time and then switch it up. Even in the last episode, he's called Sauron. And then he's like, no, I'm good. And mm -hmm. quotes Gandalf directly by the end of the episode. Um, do you think it's actually Gandalf or is that, are, are the writers and the show runners just playing loose? Because my understanding is they don't have the rights to any of the third age. And according to Tolkien's canon, Gandalf doesn't arrive in Middle Earth until the third age. But that doesn't mean they can't just make this character a generic wizard who arrives in the second age, happens to look like Gandalf and quote Gandalf and has his proclivities but he's he may never actually be called gandalf is that where they're going or do you think this is actually literal gandalf i would have said in the car and i said in the car i think it's gandalf because i think that the the showrunners did something interesting to me which was the stranger character actually mimicked some of gandalf's mannerisms as played by ian mckellum so mm -hmm. i sort of felt like it was a shout out callback homage type performance so that's why tipped me off that I thought this was Gandalf, but it's certainly possible that this is a wizard, you know, because uh, the, the other wizards, I, didn't they all come in the third age and this is set in the second age? That's right. Well, there's some, somewhere Tolkien said that there were wizards, maybe it was the blue wizards who came in the second age, but there's some conflicting material he wrote. Some wizards yeah. did come in the second age. Yeah. Cause one thing to know about the, the Tolkien, um, lore is that he wrote a lot of things and not all of it harmonizes perfectly. Right. Because <laughs> a lot of what he wrote was published posthumously and he didn't actually publish the book. It, you know, it was published by the Tolkien estate. So there's a lot of swirling lore out there and not all of it's perfectly harmonious. I'm, I'm agnostic on that. I would have said Gandalf. I did say Gandalf to you, but now the more I think about it, is it possible that this is a second age wizard of a to be determined name that's a really that's a really good question i don't know um but i think now that the sauron galadriel that sauron has been unmasked galadriel knows who it is three rings have been forged man i hate to you know say i can't wait till late 2023 but i'm just excited for late 2023 <laughs> uh, yeah i am too and i'm curious how they're going to factor in the other rings because the three mm -hmm. were supposed to be forged after the other ones i'm full of questions i enjoyed it too i wasn't flawless but overall i was happy and i'm happy with this french friday because i think people got a lot of david french out of this one we talked pro-life we talked to constitutional law we <laughs> talked cultural dynamics and even a little bit of political implication and then we nerded out on Tolkien and Lord of the Rings. What more can you ask for from a French Friday? I mean, only thing we're missing is a breakdown of the first three games, of the Grizzly season. <laughs> well, that, that I'm probably not going to share with you, but uh, <laughs> yeah, we're not doing too well with um, Chicago sports, but whatever. <laughs> I think the bears are on tonight. It's Monday. Yeah, it's they Monday. are. And that's going to probably be miserable. Anyway, <laughs> David, thank you again for your time and Thanks, for your, guys. your wisdom. Deeply appreciated. Well, thanks for having me. I always enjoy it. French Friday is a production of The Holy Post, featuring David French and me, Sky Jitani. Production by Carla Haskins. Production assistance by Julie Betcher. Editing by Jason Rugg. Music and theme song by Phil Vischer. This podcast is made possible by the support of Holy Post listeners like you. To find out how you can become a supporter of The Holy Post and to engage more common good Christian content, visit holypost.com.